Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2020 RSA President's Lecture, the highlight event of the Society's annual calendar. Of course, our setting is a little different this year. The COVID-19 crisis has brought change to literally everybody's lives over the last few months. Throughout this time, we have been continually reminded of the power of connection and community. This has been demonstrated by the fellows gathering online in greater numbers than ever before to share ideas and collaborate on new projects designed to meet challenges the pandemic has brought into focus. It is clear that the RSA's mission, values and purpose are more important today than at any time in its history. And I would like to thank the staff for their resilience, their energy and their deep commitment. I would also like to thank every fellow watching this evening from wherever you are in the world for all you do to support the society to continue in its efforts to unite people and ideas to resolve the challenges of our time. I'm very pleased to introduce this evening's distinguished speaker, Professor Kate Rayworth. Professor Rayworth is a senior research associate at Oxford University's Environmental Change Institute and professor of practice at Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Her work focuses on exploring the economic mindset needed to address the 21st century's social and ecological challenges. She is the creator of the Donut Economics Framework, a toolkit for meeting the needs of all people within the limited means of the planet. At the end of September this year, she launched the Donut Economics Action Lab to turn her ideas into action across cities, businesses and communities worldwide. At the heart of Professor Rayworth's approach is a recognition that economies, societies and the rest of the living world are complex interdependent systems. The coronavirus pandemic has proved a stark reminder of the deeply interconnected nature of human and economic health and a warning of just how vulnerable our existing systems have become. Bringing a future with thriving social and ecological health to life is the aim of an ambitious new RSA research programme, Regenerative Futures. It will explore new ways of organising our economy and our societies. Professor Rayworth's economic framework and community-led practice offers a model as we embark upon this new piece of work. So we're looking forward to the insights she will share with us this evening and to the lessons that we might learn from it as well. Please welcome Professor Rayworth for the 2020 RSA President's Lecture. Thank you so much for that extremely generous introduction. I'm really sincerely honored to be asked to give this lecture this year. And particularly in 2020, because this is not just another decade, this is a very crucial decade of transformation. And I want to begin by reflecting that the 21st century has begun with repeated crises. First, the financial meltdown of 2008, which undermined the livelihoods and security of millions of people worldwide. We are living in an era of climate and ecological breakdown, which is impacting with floods and droughts and hurricanes in nations rich and poor. And most recently, nations and cities and people worldwide have experienced COVID lockdown. Now, these crises fall with sharp inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power, of global north and global south. But they tell us that we are deeply interconnected with each other and with the rest of the living world and that the crises are emerging out of the very systems that we've created. Through financial expansion, we get 
financial breakdown. Through endless expansion of human activity and use of fossil fuels, we get to climate breakdown. And through endless globalization and travel and pushing ever more into wildlife areas, we trigger global pandemics like COVID-19. So we need to reimagine the shape of human progress from endless expansion to thriving in balance. And for this, we need a new vision of prosperity. And so I offer you a donut, the only one that actually turns out to be good for us. The aim here is to leave no one falling short in the hole in the middle of the donut without the essentials of life like food, healthcare, education, housing, political voice. These I've crowdsourced from the world's governments, which means that all of the governments in the world have already agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting these essentials. So leave no one in the hole of the donut, but get everybody over that social foundation. But at the same time, we cannot collectively overshoot the ecological ceiling because there we put so much pressure on Earth's life supporting systems that we literally push our planetary home out of balance. We cause climate breakdown. We acidify the oceans. We create a hole in the ozone layer. We cause critical loss in the web of life. And these are the nine planetary boundaries that have been recognized only just a decade ago as the critical life supporting systems that make this planet the only known habitable living planet in the universe. So we would be crazy to push ourselves beyond that ecological ceiling. So the goal here is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And suddenly the shape of progress has changed. It's no longer endless growth and expansion. It's thriving in balance. But if that's the goal, we are very far from that right now. All of the red in this picture shows you the extent to which either people are falling short on the essentials of life. We need to eliminate all of that red human deprivation from the center of the circle. But at the same time, we have massively overshot multiple planetary boundaries, especially on climate change, on excessive fertilizer use, converting too much land and on loss of biodiversity in the web of life. So we need to come back into this at from both sides at the same time. And I, I would call this humanity selfie. We, the people in these early days of the 21st century, we're the first generation to see this selfie of ourselves and recognize this double transgression. And from that moment, there's no going back. We can't expect last century's economic theories and business models and government policies to solve this challenge because they weren't designed for it. We need to come up with theories and policies and business models of our own that will bring us into this space. Now, this is the challenge at the global scale. Let's bring it down to the national scale. Brilliant researchers at Leeds University created 150 national donuts, and here's just three. On the one end, we have Rwanda, very significantly falling short on meeting people's essential needs, but not overshooting its pressure on any of those planetary boundaries. At the other end, we have the UK one of the world's high income countries that should be meeting everyone's needs, but even in the UK due to inequalities, it's falling short, but massively overshooting planetary boundaries. And this is true for every high income nation, by the way. <clears throat> so that overshoot is not only due to resource use and consumption within the land that's known as the UK, it's all the embedded resource consumption, the water, the minerals, the fibers and the carbon emissions embedded in the consumption of the UK. And then in the middle of Brazil, a country which like many is both falling short on meeting people's essential needs and already in overshoot. So must tackle them both at the same time. Let's put that into a context of 150 nations. And we can see that the sweet spot is that top left-hand corner where we would meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet. And there's not one country that can say they are there. To me, this tells us we are all developing countries now. No country in the world should be calling itself developed because against this 21st century vision and definition, we all have to undergo phenomenal transformation. The world's lowest income countries need to meet people's needs for the first time without overshooting planetary boundaries in the way that every nation before them has done. How can that be done? The world's emerging economies or middle income countries, many facing that double whammy of meeting people's needs for the first time while already coming back within planetary boundaries. How will that path be forged? And then the high income nations, that are massively overshooting planetary boundaries and still not even meeting the needs of all their people. How will they come back in on an unprecedented scale within those planetary boundaries? And even though these nations are sitting starkly apart from each other on this chart, they are of course deeply interconnected in their histories and their power relations. The history of colonialism, of structural adjustment imposed by high income countries on the rest of the world, especially the poorest, 
current debt and trade rules, resource extraction that continues today through global institutions and through private investment, and of course, the impacts of climate change caused by the highest income countries, but falling first and hardest on the lowest. So we need to transform not only the destination of every nation, but the relations between. Still, I'm telling the story here at the level of the nation. What if we bring it down again to the level of a city or a place? And that's a piece of work that we've done as Donut Economics Action Lab together with C40 Cities, with Circle Economy and Biomimicry 3.8. We created a framework and a question to ask to every ambitious 21st century city. So I invite you to listen to this question through the lens of your own city or town or place. How can our city be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. And wrapped up in that is four fundamental questions. First, what would it mean for the people of our city to thrive? That will depend on whether the city is Stockholm or Dar es Salaam. People of a place have a different context, culture, values, and history. So they must be the ones who determine what it means to thrive. Second, what would it mean for our city to thrive within its natural habitat? Where is your city placed on Earth's surface? Which biome is it part of? What is nature's genius where you are? How does nature sequester carbon and store groundwater after a storm and house biodiversity and cool the climate from the treetops to the forest floor? And what if the city could aim to be as generous as that wildland next door and likewise sequester carbon and house biodiversity and store groundwater? That is a truly biomimetic ambition for 21st century cities. So these two questions set out local aspiration to be thriving people in a thriving place. But as we know, every city and town on the planet is drawing in resources from elsewhere. And so has to set that local aspiration in the context of global responsibility. So how can our city respect the health of the whole planet? Where is the timber coming from, the food, the water resources, where are carbon emissions being emitted around the world in the name of our city's prosperity? And how can our city come back within planetary boundaries? While you think of the electronics and clothing and food and construction materials being imported into your city, their ecological footprint, but also think of their social impact. How can our city respect the well-being of people worldwide? Who stitched and sewed the clothes we wear? Who picked and packed the food we buy? who dug and transported the minerals that build our homes and our city buildings? And how can their rights also be respected and those of the communities in which they live? So we offer these questions to ambitious cities. Yes, it's complex, it's a lot to take on, but the questions don't go away if you don't confront them. And what we've found in workshops with city policymakers from Portland and Philadelphia and Amsterdam is that sitting in front of their own city portrait was actually empowering each person could recognize their issue, their sector, but see it in the context of a whole and draw new connections and see synergies and possibilities that weren't visible before when the city was working in a much more siloed way. So how can cities come into the donut? I believe there are two fundamental transformations in the city dynamics that need to be created. First, cities need to move away from linear degenerative industrial production that taking Earth's resources, making them into stuff we want, using it for a while and throwing it away. And instead, turn them into regenerative process where resources are used again and again, far more carefully, more creatively, more collectively. So from degenerative to regenerative design, but also transforming the dynamics of cities from being centralizing of opportunity and value in the hands of a few to being distributive of that same opportunity and value. So what can these dynamic shifts look like in practice? So let's think first of regenerative design. Well, look to the city of Curitiba, which since the 1970s has been pioneering rapid transit, which makes long scale distance available and affordable for many people and far faster and smarter than traveling by car. They've inspired over a hundred cities worldwide to follow their lead. And now of course they're moving into introducing electric buses. Think of the cities like Paris that during COVID lockdown have taken advantage of empty streets and shifted lanes from cars to cycles and massively expanded the number of cycle routes. Cities all over the world have been doing this, cleaning the air, but also making transport more pleasant, safer and affordable for many, many people. Think of cities like Amsterdam that are introducing circular strategy, including circular building codes. So requiring 
a halving of the number of new raw materials being used in the city by 2030. That means construction has to transform. Resources from buildings that are going to be removed need to be reused again and again. This building, for example, in Amsterdam, isn't a glue shut building. Nothing is cemented and locked together. Everything is clicked and bolted together. And it's made of wood, so it's sequestering carbon in the very fibers of the building. But once the life of the building or its materials is finished, they can be unbolted, unclicked, and used again in a new way. And then think of the city of Medellin in Colombia. They have brought biomimicry and nature back to the heart of the city, opening up the river and making river parks throughout the city, making it a place for people to gather, but also to bring back nature through the natural flow of that river in the heart of the city. So these are just some examples of bringing regenerative design into cities. What about distributive design that instead of centralizing value, shares it far more equitably. The city of Preston in the UK has been pioneering, re really investing in small and medium enterprises and bringing back local community enterprise through using anchor institutions such as city hall and hospitals and schools to buy on long-term contracts from local suppliers, but also supporting and enabling cooperatives to form in the city. In the city of Vienna, few people know that over 60% of Vienna's residents live in social housing, which is owned either by the city municipality itself or in subsidized cooperatives. And that means that the vast majority of people live in high quality, affordable housing, which makes it really a much more affordable city to live in than most other major cities in the world. Think of Seattle, which back in 2015 introduced the living wage, $15 an hour enabling everybody in that city to be certain of earning a decent minimum wage. People said it would make restaurants in the city unaffordable. Actually, it turned out that even those who worked in restaurants could at last go out to restaurants. So it opened up the possibilities of city amenities for many more people. And then again, think of cities like Paris that have transformed highways to parks, enabling commoners to gather, enabling city residents to meet each other, to connect in public spaces and building public luxury. Again, these are just examples of distributive design that's taking off in many cities worldwide. But also cities can recognize and enable our multiple economic identities. And this is the diagram I would start economics with, recognizing their economies are bedded in societies. They are social constructs that we design and can redesign. And society itself is embedded in the living world, drawing in Earth's materials and matter, spewing out waste and pollution. But when we look inside the economy, Mainstream economics starts just with the market, as if we show up as rational economic man, you're either a consumer or producer, you're either shopping or working or shopping or working. Are you labor or are you capital? And this tells us that the traits we should be bringing to our roles in the economy should be competition and self-interest, which actually itself has been debunked. But this is a very narrow view of our roles in the economy, because in relation to the state, we are public servant, resident, voter and protest all crucial roles that we can play in shaping our city state. In the household, we may be parent, partner, relative or child providing that unpaid care work that makes life worth living in the home. And then in the commons, we may be volunteer, sharer, co-creator or steward. And one thing that I think people have learned through COVID lockdown is that when COVID literally forces marketplaces to close due to the need for physical distancing, the role of the state and care and essential workers became immediately visible. The role of the household in providing that unpaid care and uh, attention to those who are ill at home, but also the pressure on households of looking after children who are off school and the do intense domestic pressure has led in many places to an increase in domestic violence, which cannot be ignored, but also the rise of the commons. Commoners providing food banks, community kitchens, caring for the community, even just making a WhatsApp group and connecting with the street. And many people say the one thing they don't want to lose after COVID lockdown is that sense of community, the we of society and the we of city. And I think cities have a crucial role in ensuring that they respect and enable us to value all of these roles that make up our economic selves and that make life thrive. So how can cities be part of this transformation. What matters, I think, is more than the design of the layout of city streets, it's actually the design of city institutions. And from many mayors and city officials I've been talking to over recent years, I've really heard that there's a big pivot going on, a transformation in the vision of what a city should be in service of. From cities that say last century were in service to growth, 
to cities that are in service to thriving. So the 20th century question of how do we make our city grow is very quickly giving way to how do we make our growing city thrive? Due to urbanization, more people may be moving here, but what we're aiming to do is create a thriving place within planetary boundaries. And I think there are five key design traits that again, we can bring to thinking about any city or town or village or community that make up the institutional design and whether or not that place can pivot. The first, of course, is purpose. What is the purpose of this place? What's it in service to? Listen to the speech of mayors. Are they talking about growth and competition? Or are they talking about thriving and collaboration? The city of Amsterdam, for example, has given itself a new vision to be a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all citizens while respecting planetary boundaries. That kind of ambition begins to set out a new vision and clear direction for transforming place. What about the city's networks, how it relates to its suppliers, to its own citizens, to other cities, how it's procuring, but also how it's procuring collectively with others. The network of C40 cities, which are the world's 96 cities that have committed to tackling climate change on the, on the scale required to stay under 1.5 degrees of global heating. Many of those cities have come together to collectively procure electric buses, 100% electric. And by making that collective contract, for cities that are home to over 36 million people, the scale of that collective procurement has brought forward the possibility from companies, from vehicle making companies that weren't ready to do it on this scale. But thanks to their collective action, they've pushed that time forward to 2020 or 2025. Governance. How is a city governed? Who has voice at the table? Of course, one thing we're seeing rising across the UK and the world is the rise of deliberative democracy through the form of citizens' assemblies being used in cities and nations and regions, giving voice to local residents who, without the pressure of short-term political cycles, it turns out can often make longer, bigger vision transformatory decisions than politicians are able to. But also under governance, let's think about turning purpose and the long-term vision of a place into short-term targets. This is the decade of action. So we need cities that step up and take, commit to targets within that decade. Glasgow in the UK, for example, has set itself the goal of being net zero carbon city by 2030. Amsterdam has committed to reducing by half its use of new materials by 2030. As the vice mayor of Amsterdam, Marika van Dornink says, by setting these ambitious goals, we don't make it harder for ourselves. We actually make it easier because city residents and companies stop lobbying to say, well, we're the exception from the rule. We're the ones who don't have to change. We need more time. It becomes clear that we all need to change and we just get on with doing it. Put in place a long, legal, loud message for a target within 10 years. And that is what will kick transformation. So we can transform cities, purpose and networks and governments. Now let's get down to the really profound stuff which lies at the bottom of this signboard. But of course, the most profound stuff usually lies deepest. Ownership. How is the city owned? Who owns the land? Who owns the housing? In Vienna, it's the city and that makes all the difference. Who owns the data? Cities like Barcelona are committed to open data and that's transformative of our digital futures and our sense of ownership over that data. And ultimately, who owns the finance and where is finance coming from and where is it going and what is it demanding? What is finance in service to in the city? Is it in service to the purpose that the city has chosen or is it finance in service to itself and indeed got the city serving finance? Cities like Portland and many others have historically earned a lot of their revenue from charging for car parking. Well, if they're gonna move car parking out, where in future will that revenue come from? And where is the city's own finances going to be invested? Again, a group of C40 cities have recently got together, 12 major cities from London to Cape Town to Vancouver to Oslo, and committed to divest all city finance from fossil fuels and redirect it into regenerative and green investments. Again, cities can use their finance to bring about that transformation within their own boundaries and far beyond. So we need to transform the design of cities. A Donut Economics Act action now, we've created the Donut City portrait that we've trialed in several cities. And Amsterdam was the first to publish theirs in April of this year, right at the height of their COVID infection rate. And 
by publishing it, they clearly kicked off what we're seeing is peer-to-peer inspiration, which is phenomenally powerful. There was traction worldwide in the media about what's happening in Amsterdam. They're setting themselves a new vision of how they want to emerge from this emergency. And we published, as Donut Economics Action Lab and our partners, we published the methodology of how we made this city portrait within just a couple of months. Already, there are towns and cities worldwide who have picked this up, followed Amsterdam's lead, and are creating their own methodology and their own adaptation, whether it's being led by the mayor or by universities or local communities. But again, this isn't just happening in cities. We started with global north cities because we believe they're a a pivot point for action, but also cities in the global north have the first and fastest responsibility to move because of their historic causation of climate change. But this is also happening in neighborhoods. Our friends at Civic Square in Birmingham are creating the neighborhood donut, literally creating this beautiful donut monument, inviting local residents to come and have conversations about what it means to thrive in this place. And then at the level of the nation, the nation of Costa Rica has created an initiative called Regenerate Costa Rica using the concept of the donut to show the vision of who they want to become. So when I was recently in my local stationery shop, I stumbled across this wrapping paper and you can imagine how delighted I was because I thought that symbolizes the potential of this tool. It can be used from regions to nations, to cities, to states, to towns, to villages, to streets and neighborhoods. I think of it as bringing to life Eleanor Ostrom's concept of polycentric governance. There's no one level at which we need to govern and imagine the futures of what it means to thrive. We'll manage it at multiple levels and have multiple conversations which will overlap and intersect. So if this resonates with you, I warmly invite you to join us at Donut Economics Action Lab, where many change makers have already picked up this concept and playfully started putting it into action. We've launched the Action Lab online to bring together this community so that people can show what they're doing, how they're innovating with these ideas, the adaptations they're making, the successes they're having. And we're loving seeing the stories that are appearing, whether it's a Maori reinterpretation of the donut or how it's being put into practice in Copenhagen and Costa Rica. So I warmly invite people to join us in Donut Economics Action Lab. We believe that spreading ideas this way, change maker to change maker, through self-organizing groups that worldwide pick up tools and put them to use in the way that makes most sense to them. For a decade like this one, where we've no time to wait and every reason to find the change makers now, we are excited about the potential of working this way. And I hugely look forward to talking about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent lecture, Kate. Um, It's our great pleasure to welcome you once again to the RSA platform, and we're delighted that you could join us for what is one of the key moments of the year for the RSA uh, and its uh, fellows. Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor, the RSA's chief executive, um, and uh, we're going to take the next few minutes uh, discussing some of the key ideas in Kate's uh, lecture further exploring insights and inspirations she shared with us today. Uh, By the way, if you're watching online, a quick reminder that you're welcome to continue the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag RSA Economy or in our YouTube chat. So, uh, Kate, we're particularly fascinated at the RSA to hear about your work in the context of what we're doing around the concept of regenerative futures, um, which is a program which seeks to explore uh, social and environmental issues together and explore how those could be applied to reimagine uh, whole uh, systems. So as you can see, any very parallel uh, mission to your donut economics. So an enormous amount of synergy and we hope to work with you going forward. But um, before I get into some of the issues, you have to Forgive me asking a trivial question, but this concept of the donut, um, it's a meme. Mm. You just explained it's being discussed everywhere, but yet in a way it's not intuitive. I think before you did this work, if I'd said to people, well, the critical concept when it comes to saving the planet is is a donut, people might have thought I was slightly odd. When did you first think of the concept of the donut and are there are there ever times when you 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 wonder whether or not 
you should have, there was there, perhaps there was a different kind of parallel that you could have used, or is, were you just lucky to have to have landed with this concept, which is so easy for people to grasp? Well, so the donut is a ridiculous name, right? Let's just say that for a start. It's uh, and some people say, how can you name the future of humanity after this sugary snack? But the shape of a donut is a shape that everybody recognizes. So it's very familiar. I could call it an annulus or a torus, but most people would feel totally alienated already. So for me, the moment when I first drew this was I had just come back from maternity leave, I'd been immersed in the unpaid caring economy for a year, come back to my job at Oxfam uh, in 2009. And a colleague was showing me some slides of some big ideas that had happened in the past year. And I saw this diagram of a circle with big red lines shooting out. And it was, of course, the planetary boundaries research by Johan Rockström, Will Steffen, and around 30 leading Earth system scientists who said, this is Earth's safe operating space, it's a circle, and we've overshot it. And I had this visceral reaction when I saw it. And I realized with hindsight, it was because I'd always been deeply influenced by Herman Daly, the founding father of ecological economics, who said, when you draw the economy, make sure you draw it inside a circle and label the circle the environment. Because we have to recognize that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, but it wasn't quantified. And suddenly when I saw this work of planetary boundaries, it was if bang, there is the circle that daly has been talking about for decades, quantified, divided into nine life supporting systems with numbers on them. These earth system scientists have made it specific and real and measurable. So I was absolutely stunned by this. And I had this very profound feeling, this is the beginning of a new kind of economics. And I was sitting in this big open plan office in Oxfam, surrounded by people who were campaigning uh, for children's rights to health and education across Asia, who were raising money to prevent famine in the Sahel. And I thought, hang on, if we pulled back to the center of this circle where humanity's putting almost no pressure on the planet, withdrawing no water, converting no land, uh, using none of Earth's timbers, withdrawing no fish, that's not a thriving place. That's actually death and destitution for billions of people. So it's not a circle. There must be an inner limit of resource use. And I drew a, a circle in a circle. And the first time I showed it in a meeting, rather nervously, of Earth system scientists, one of them, Tim Lenton, brilliant ocean scientist, he said, that's the diagram we've been missing. It's not a circle, it's a donut. So everybody can blame Tim Lenton for the name. <laughs> but, but I want to say that actually this idea has a long history. I mean, back in the 1970s, Barbara Ward gave a speech on sustainable development. She said, I see sustainable development as having inner limits of human need and outer limits of the environment. Well, she was drawing this visually with words. So actually, if you think of the donut, it, it invites us to thrive almost like a heartbeat. And I think there's something profound about circles which are holistic and self-contained, but this one invites us to thrive between limits. And so I would stick by that shape. Um, some people find the name the donut too tricky. You can call it a bagel, you can call it a lifesaver, a wheel, whatever anything you like, but, but people aren't intimidated by donuts. So they know this is friendly, approachable economics. Well, I guess we've got Homer Simpson and Krispy Kreme to thank for the fact that everyone thinks of donuts now as circles rather than as, That's right. rather than as jam donuts. Anyway, enough of donuts. Um, you talked in your speech about um, COVID. Um, and it seems to me it's a kind of really interesting picture. Of course, a recognition of risk, a recognition of what happens if you don't invest in the long term the importance of community resources and commons, all of that uh, suggests that when we emerge from COVID and the RSA has done a lot of thinking about the relationship between crisis and what comes after, that we may emerge in a world where we are more able to understand the challenges and to make the right choices. But of course, there are other arguments as well. One is, well, we, we'll be emerging into an economic crisis. And often in an economic crisis, people will say, look, it doesn't matter what kind of growth, we've just got to get back to growth. And the second one, which is the flip side of something we're all celebrating at the moment, is of course, science has come to the rescue. And there is a danger there, is there not, that people will think, well, hang on, in the end, science sorted out COVID. And when scientists really focus their minds on it, it you know, they managed to do something which normally takes 10 years and managed to do it in looks like a year. 
won't science also come to the rescue when it comes to the environment? So overall, Kate, tell me what you think COVID has done to the debate and to people's open-mindedness and what are the opportunities uh, and what are the risks as we move into a post-COVID world? So I think COVID has given us one more shock on top of shock because it's not the only one. We, right? It's it's another one on top of, but it's been such a disruptive one in literally disrupting everybody's everyday life. <clears throat> so it's come to the heart of our homes and whether or not we're allowed to meet in the streets. So it, it's deeply personal as well as national and global. Yes, it's been created an enormous economic crisis, but crises are disruptions. And we know from the history of transformation or capture, it's disruptions that create those disruptive moments. Do you take them or not? So the idea of just saying, well, let's just, let's just get back to normal. And when everything's normal again, then we can think about changing. Change doesn't happen in normal change. Change doesn't happen in normal times. Change happens in disrupted times. Milton Friedman knew that, right? He said, never let a, a good crisis go to waste. We have to have the ideas lying around until that moment comes. And actually, I'm, I'm seeing that the ideas of donut economics have been lying around for eight years or so. And this, I believe, is partly why so many change makers from mayors to, to governments to local communities are picking it up in the midst of a crisis, find the ideas that are available. Wh which way do we want to emerge from the emergency? How do we want to grow back? You know, Donella Meadows, the mother of systems thinking, she said growth is the stupidest of gold. It's not a goal. It's a means to going somewhere. But where do you want to go? You must always ask growth of what and for whom and for how long and at what cost to others. So we can't just pursue growth when we know so much more about the diversity and the multiple balances of life that make life work. And, and it's really clear in so many countries that, you know, investing in green energy, green solutions, job creating, uh, whether it's insulating homes or laying down cycleways, this is a moment to make that transformation happen. And I wouldn't say, oh, science has sorted this one out. It'll sort other things out. Nobody wants to be trapped in their homes again for a year while scientists get on solving with the next problem. But it's clear that science isn't sorting out climate change. If anything, nature is the greatest offer of climate change. Natural systems work. She's been working for 3.8 billion years. So to bring back nature solutions and to rewild the, the land, to, to replenish the soil, to bring rivers back to the heart of cities as they're doing in Medellin. This doesn't require high-tech science that's not yet been invented. It requires place-based solutions that already make sense. So sometimes we have to get let go of the high-tech flashy investments and actually turn to the solutions that are already available. Okay, I, I want to explore the... the the power of this notion of places and people living within planetary means. Uh, there's a wonderful well-known book by the philosopher G.A. Cohen called If You're an Egalitarian, How Come You're So Rich, in which he highlights the fact that many people on the left have too much money to reconcile with their egalitarian goals. I, I guess the question I'm, all, I'm trying to get to is, if people focus on living with their own, within their own means, is there a danger that that symbolic goal of reaching a point where they can say, well, we're not having more than we ought to have, consuming more than we ought to consume, becomes more important than potentially innovating, for example, in a way which can change the world? So is there a danger we can look inwards and go, well, I've got to be... The, the critical point is, is for me as a city or as a country to be virtuous rather than to say, well, look, rich countries are living within their means, but they have the resources and the capacity to transform the world. And that's the thing that they should be focusing on. I think, I think they go absolutely together. You know, sometimes people see boundaries and say, that's a limit. I feel stifled in this space. But actually ask, ask an architect, ask a creator, ask an inventor, and they say boundaries are what unleash our creativity. Give me boundaries, give me parameters, and then I can set to work. And that's the energy that I feel and see and hear every time I connect with people in Amsterdam. They are running with the boundaries that they've given themselves. They've said, we're going to live within planetary boundaries. We need to massively reduce our resource use. We're going to be a 100% circular city by 2050, but let's bring that forward. We're going to cut resource use by half by 2030. There are really vibrant conversations happening in that city. How are we going to build homes for 
more than a million new people who are going to arrive in our city without increasing its total footprint. How are we going to reuse construction materials? Where are we going to store them in the city? How are we going to change building regulation? So there's this incredible dynamism and innovation and invention that will create peer-to-peer -peer inspiration for other places because they've accepted the boundaries, which are there. Let's just accept them and then get on with innovating within them. The least innovative places, the ones where we just see endless expansion. Why innovate? There's just always more. And it's lazy and it's so much more energizing to be given constraints and innovate within them. I've um, been doing a, a weekly podcast since the crisis called Building Bridges to the Future. And I've had a lot of guests talking about environmental issues. And one of the things that's clearly an issue of controversy really is around capitalism in its role in moving to a sustainable, a truly sustainable economy. So a few months ago, I spoke to Bill McKibben, who I think, you know, who's a pioneer. And actually, he's quite hopeful. He thinks there has been a real shift in certain elements of kind of big business and big finance. And he's hopeful about that, you know, maybe because he's been so successful in leading um, globally uh, on kind of disinvestment from fossil fuels. More recently, I spoke to Noam Chomsky and Robert Pollan, and for, for them, it's inconceivable that you can achieve sustainability without pretty radical reform to the capitalist uh, uh, system. Where do you stand in that debate, Kate? So first of all, I always want to unpack that word capitalism, because I find that when people go into debates around capitalism, and I've listened and been part of many, you suddenly realize people are talking about different things. So for some people, capitalism means, and I've asked a lot of people, you know, what do you mean? Well, uh, an economy based on markets. Oh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't define it that loosely. Um, I think markets are an incredibly powerful mechanism. Adam Smith was onto something. They distribute information, but we can have markets with very different kinds of market actors. Some people think capitalism is the separation of the means of production from the workers and 20th century technologies with big oil rigs and Fordist factories led to that, actually 21st century technologies with solar panels and desktop uh, production are reuniting workers with technology. So we don't have to give that away as capitalism. I think where you're going is capitalism, the idea of it being that enterprise that's designed to maximize profits and financial markets that pursue high rates of return. And is that compatible with bringing us within planetary boundaries? Personally, I am a skeptic on that. And I'll go back to that signboard because the very same signboard that we would use with cities, we always bring to every company, any company that wants to engage with the concept of donut economics. We say we can talk all we like about your products. We really need to talk about the design of your enterprise. What are you in service to? Why do you even exist? Do you have a, a small purpose about being the biggest car manufacturer in Europe? Or do you have a living purpose of like Tony's Chocolony, a Dutch chocolate company? They want to make the world's all the world's chocolate companies 100% free of slavery in the supply chain. So a living purpose that's much bigger than yourself. How are you networked? Who are you buying from? Who are your suppliers? Who are your customers? And how do you instill your values in them? How do you govern yourselves? What are your metrics? What are your principles? Who's got voice? And what's your culture? But now again, let's go down to the deep stuff. How are you owned? You could be owned by your workers, by the state, by family, by venture capital, by the shareholders in the stock market. And those very different designs of ownership profoundly shape what finance is demanding, what finance invested in your enterprise is demanding. Is it demanding a high and fast financial return and I'm gonna sell you, sell your share if you don't deliver that to me now? Or is it actually invested in you for long patient returns that are social and environmental as well as a fair financial return and what's fair is a big question. So to me, this is key to redesigning enterprise. And there are so many new models of enterprise, social enterprises, employee-owned enterprises that show that there's not only one design. So I wouldn't sit happy at all with the 20th century corporation model and say, we can make all the regulations and culture work for that. I think we can design and redesign the very structures of enterprise itself. So I, I take the word capitalism off the table. I say, let's create enterprise that enables us to meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. It's going to have a very different design from 20th century corporations we've inherited. Thanks, Kate. I think you're probably the first speaker I've chaired anyway who's 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 made their own homemade prop 
to <laughs> illustrate their core concepts. I think this is a this is a as a as an organisation that prizes design. I think this is something we should advocate that uh, all all no one can present a typology or conceptual framework without making it at home. It's a lockdown bonus. <laughs> um, two final questions. One came out of a conversation I had the other day with a very senior Whitehall official, and it wasn't an issue that I had been aware of before. But she said to me, there is a real tension between the goal of biodiversity and the goal, the goal of greenhouse gas emissions, or there can be tensions, and there are kind of different camps. Those who want to focus everything on reducing carbon emissions, and that's an absolute priority. It's a pressing priority. And they tend to die and grade biodiversity as being quite such an urgent goal. And then there are others for whom biodiversity is absolutely critical because we are make, making decisions now which are irreversible because we're losing species as we speak. Do, do you, do you, have you come across that kind of attention? Is it one that you've explored at all as you've thought about the donor? So I know that the Earth System scientists who created the planetary boundaries concept just over a decade ago, did it precisely to say, hey, world, yes, climate change is a major urgent crisis. But by the way, there are actually nine critical life supporting systems of this planet. And we'd be crazy to take our eye off any of them or indeed destroy one in the process of trying to defend another. So do not destroy the web of life in the process of trying to cut carbon emissions. But Nature's worked for billions of years by having a thriving biodiversity and a stable climate. So that's this planet's natural state. So the idea that these two are somehow fundamentally in conflict with each other doesn't make sense. It's how nature's always thrived. We humans need to figure out how to live and run our lives and run industry and government in ways that allow that natural combination to come together. Rewilding brings back biodiversity and sequesters carbon. Nature does it together. So no, I wouldn't try and set up a dichotomy between the two of them. In fact, the, the very goal of the donor is to say, hey, we need to look at these things together. We need to look for the synergies of tackling the biodiversity crisis and climate crisis and creating jobs at the same time. And how do we do that? Again, it's giving ourselves boundaries and innovating within it and then re-innovating finance and business so it's compatible with that rather than saying, these things don't fit with financial markets. Well, then there's a problem with financial markets. They are not compatible with conditions conducive to life. And if anything needs to get redesigned, it's them. Finally, Kate, um, in hosting COP26, the UK has got the chance to provide global mm. leadership and arguably in the context of Brexit, a particularly urgent need to do that. And to be fair to our government, they've made some pretty major and quite exciting announcements in the last week in terms of their... Uh, intentions. Can you tell us, as we think about COP26, what should we be looking out for? And are there particular goals that we ought to be, because you talk about the importance of politics, are there particular goals that we should be pressing our leaders to commit to at COP26? So the UK has actively invited the world to our shores for COP26. Please come here for this critical moment. It should have been, of course, now. It's delayed a year. But it's a really critical moment to ask ourselves, who do we want to be when we welcome our guests and hold this essential meeting? For me, first of all, I believe that the, we have to bring forward the ambition. 2050 is too late, especially for the world's richest countries. I mean, climate change impacts are hitting sooner and harder than the models showed, than scientists predicted. So we need nations and cities and people to act sooner and faster and more deeply cutting their emissions than was intended. But also look at the, look at the inspiration of places like Amsterdam that are setting themselves concrete targets and then just getting on with the action. Stop this dallying of, of you know, non-committal or far too distant targets, it prevents us from the action that so many people within government, within business, within young people, within universities want to put into practice. I'm really glad that it's happening in the city of Glasgow because Glasgow, I think, is leading the UK in many ways. Having the, the earliest commitment to being net zero carbon by 2030, Glasgow is toying, for example, or considering trialing um, universal basic income. So showing that it's a city that's open to experimentation. We don't know what policies will work, but you know what? Let's try and find out and see what happens. It's a city that's home to 
um, and, and based in a, in, in a nation of Scotland that talks about well-being. So Scotland and Nicola Sturgeon have embraced the concept of being a well-being economy. And again, that's putting that new purpose at the top of the vision of institutions. So I think it's crucial that the UK goes further, pushes deeper, and shows that it's actually putting really ambitious targets in place in the near term that just unleashes the creativity that this nation wants to recover. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. It's been fascinating talking with you, Kate, and thank you for again for your excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Real pleasure and honour. Head over to the RSA website for links to explore Kate's work in more detail, as well as finding out more about the Regenerative Futures programme that builds on the RSA's heritage of work on circular economy, climate, social justice and citizen participation. We'd love to hear your ideas on how we can work collectively to transform our economy and our society. So do get involved in the conversation across social media using the hashtag RSA economy. Your Royal Highness, thank you for joining us today and for your kind opening remarks. Many thanks to Kate Rayworth for her brilliant 2020 RSA President's Lecture. And thank you all for watching.